Hey, good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's good to, uh, good to be seen. I always want to say uh, it's good to see you, but I, I, know, I can't help it. I've done it for so many years, that's what I have to say. But anyway, I'm excited, okay? And I hope you are too. If you uh, happen to have your quarterly, uh, you can see that you know we are starting a new section uh, uh, today. And, uh, and by starting this new section, um, you know, we, we're, we're going to be reintroduced to something new. And um, new as far as our study is concerned, not new as far as the Bible is concerned, is uh, if some of this stuff may be new to, uh, to some people, not to others, but it's always, always God's word is profitable for us, regardless of what it is, when it is, and, and, and when it's delivered. And so with that being said, I really, really want to go ahead and get into this. It's, it's, it's rather long, and I'm going to try to uh, condense as many verses as I possibly can. You know, I love to go, it is Sunday school. And I really love to dig into each verse, but uh, sometimes because of time, we can't dig as deep as I would like. And we also, some verses lean themselves to, you know, you have to put verses together. And so, but what we're doing tonight is, so I said we're starting this new section, and the new section is All In, A Life of Commitment. And that's what the whole section is going to be. There's, there's going to be seven lessons on this. And uh, we're going to see one word coming up throughout all seven of these lessons. And that word obviously is commitment. Now, when we look at commitment, we do know that Jesus spent three years on earth in his earthly mission. And uh, would you say that Jesus was committed to his mission to, when the Father sent him to earth? Uh, yes, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. So, what we're going to explore during this time is Jesus' commitment to us and in turn how our commitment to Jesus is to be. And so with that being said, what we're going to do, we're going to start off with the first section right here, which is, uh, is Romans, if you want to look at it in your Bible or if you have your quarterly, uh, it's going to be Romans 5, chapter 5, verses 6 through 12 and verses 18 through 21. Now, that's Romans 5, verses 6 through 12, and 18 through 21. Now, the point, uh, today's lesson is, uh, well, we're going to, it's going to be Christ's commitment to us. We're starting off with the, with the C word. The point is, even at our worst, Christ was fully committed to love us and bring us to God. To bring us to the Father. Now, when we look at commitment, let's, let's just put it in context. If you, if you look at commitments, we look at um, just for example, uh, we can we can look at a life connection for us, uh, like marriage. A, a marriage is a really big commitment to most people. Hopefully, to every Christian, it is. But to everyone, it should be. It's something. Uh, it is a is, is a sacred trust. Is what it is. Now, in order for a marriage to work. Would you say that both people have to be committed to the marriage? Of course, it takes both people to do that. And uh, and another one, it would be like uh, I like I like the analogy that's in your quarterly about the uh, also about the um, about a bank, about uh, getting a loan at the bank. We all have to get loans. Well, some people might not, but uh, us, us us average people have to get loans. And now, just think of the commitment that has to be made in order to fulfill that loan. Now, when we go to the bank and we, we ask for a loan, what is the bank going to tell us? They're going to say, okay, we will give you the money, but this is what you've got to do in order to get it. You are going to have to pay it back, and these are the terms. And you go, oh, i got to pay it back. I didn't know I had to commit that much. So of course not. You know you don't do that, but that's what it is. It, both sides has to work in order to make the commitment fulfilled. So the setting of the uh, the, the lesson is in Romans one through four. Uh, Paul wrote that people everywhere, everyone, uh, Gentiles and Jews, had to be saved because everyone had sinned against God. That's what he wrote. Now when he got when he got to Romans five, he does that. He affirmed that people had to, to give themselves to Christ uh, because, because th that he made them right by giving themselves to him. And that's what we're going to be talking about is getting our, giving ourselves to Christ because of the commitment that he made to us. So we're going to go ahead and pick up in Romans 5, verse 6 through 8. For when we 
were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now we go back to the first verse here, verse 6. It says, when we, but for when we were yet without strength. Now when you think about without strength, what does without strength mean? Is that we were weak. We didn't have, you know, without Christ, we have no real strength. We can think about, you know, the, uh, how strong we are and, and how strong as athletes are and, and strongman competition, Ironman competitions and stuff like that. Physical strength, but it's more than just physical strength. It's, it's the strength of Christ that lives in, in us. And it says, but we were without that strength. Okay, and we'll get to why we were without that strength. It says, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, in due time, I like those words right there and because what is due time? Now, we, we say that all the time, you know, and it's like, well, you know, we'll get, we, 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 I hear it a lot at the house, you know, it's like, I, I, it's like, well, I, maybe I shouldn't do it, but it's like, it's like, when, Don, when are you going to do so? And so I'll, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll, I'll get it when it needs to be done. I'll need it when it needs to be done. Due time for God is a completely different thing. It's not procrastination as far as uh, he's concerned. What God does is everything that is done is in his time. Think about it. God's perfect time. So this was at a time when God took everything that was happening in the world and the sins of the people, and it, 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 it had ripened to the point where he knew that it was the right time to send his son Jesus. And it says, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, for scarcely, for a righteous man will one die, yet per adventure. Now, you know, per adventure is archaic. archaic. Okay, it's an old word that's used in the Old Testament a lot, and, and, and Paul, Paul drug it out. Okay, but it, it's, it's perhaps is all it really is. So, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. And, and what, that, what, what that is saying is, well, then we've got to look at who Christ died for. He died for who? Everyone. He died for everyone, and everyone is a sinner. So when we look at people dying for someone else, Paul, what Paul is saying is the chances of a person dying and taking the place of, and dying for someone else, pretty slim chance of that. But possibly if a person is a good enough person and a righteous person that a person may give their life for that person. Well, when we look in the context of that today, we can see that we do have people that are right. And, and, and we do have people that are, are righteous as far as their, their love for their fellow man or woman. Okay? We, when, we, when we look at this, I, I looked at that verse and I thought about it at the time that Paul said that. And then I look at where we are today, and I do look at the goodness of mankind. Uh, I have done a lot of doom and gloom here lately, but we're talking the goodness of mankind right here. Uh, will people die for a stranger? Absolutely. They do it every day. Good people die every day saving someone else's life. When you, you know, I was looking uh, at the cover of, um, on the, uh, on the Herschel Hobbes uh, commentary, and uh, the cover on it was a, uh, a fireman uh, uh, up in the basket with a, uh, with a hose. And, you know, of course, the first thing that comes to your mind, how many times does a fireman go into a burning building to see someone they've never seen in their lives? And people say, well, that was their job. That's what they're supposed to do. It's still, they're still saving lives of people they did not know. Um, I, did you know that, like, North Carolina so far this year, um, there's... Uh, there's been at least seven swimming deaths uh, in, in, in the state. This happened uh, in the ocean. Uh, uh, there was a couple in Hatteras, uh, Topsail, Carolina Beach, uh, uh, I think you see uh, Emerald Isle. 
uh, there, there was there was there was people that drowned. There was uh, in one of the places uh, there was two guys. There was an old guy in uh, Emerald Isle that was seventy seven years old from Pennsylvania that got, got caught in a rip current. The other guy that was with him that was seventy seven year old went out to save him. They both died. That was a guy going out to save a friend. And then you've had um, uh, a good example was uh, th and this one's a nice one right here at uh, at uh, Cape Hatteras. A uh, guy and his wife were in their pickup riding down the beach, and they saw a couple girls struggling out in the ocean. The guy jumps out of his truck, goes out, and saves both of their lives, and he and he made it too. On the other side of that, there's also ones that went out, and we saw this on the local news not too long ago, and that was uh, the one at uh, Topsail, I think, and it may have been one even at Carolina Beach, I believe, uh, where a guy's children were struggling and he went out to save the children the children made it and he didn't and with the list can go on and on because we also can think about you and your children what you would do of course you would we look we see people that uh, are distinguished in the military uh you know getting the uh congressional medal of honor for the fact that they 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 gave it some time posthumously because they gave their lives to protect their fellow uh, fellow soldiers, and so there's a lot of people that would give their lives. But the thing is, let's look at verse eight. For God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here's the big difference in in heroes that die for other people. And the biggest hero of all, Christ willingly gave his life for people that hated him. Think about it. Think about his ministry and his death. He gave his life for people that hated him. Now, when we look at that, you have to think, I mean, well, it's just like in, uh, in, in 1 John uh, 4, 19. Uh, John made it real clear, you know, when we... We love him because he first loved us. So it's not, it's the other way around with other religions. Other religions have it so that if you're good and you do good enough, you're going to be okay. You're going to make it to nirvana or whatever you want to call, you're going to go with that religion. Okay, go to heaven even if you're like Muslim. And, uh, but the thing is, that's their religion. You've got to be good enough in order to be recognized. It's just the opposite. Christ died for sinners. Died for sinners. And, that, and that's, that's the, the completely difference between Christianity and all other religions. Knowingly took on the sin of of all sinners. Verse 9 says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, in verse 10 and 11, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So verse 9 said, much more than being now justified by his blood. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to be able to just not chase rabbits. Okay. I can't help it. Uh, I'm going to have to in order to, I just can't help it. Okay. When we look at being justified, okay, we have to look at justified We uh, as a Christian, how important that word justified is. What was justified? Justified is being made right with God. Okay? We are being made right with him. And through the blood of Jesus, that's how we have been made right as Christians. Now, made right, it's a legal term is what it amounts to. But it's also, justification is a gift. Now, I'm going to... Stray, like I said, I stray away from the, the, the total lesson itself right here, but I can't help it. I, I, I've, I've got to. Um, because when we're talking justification, uh, we're talking our salvation. And uh, our, our salvation in Christ uh, involves uh, three gifts. Okay? Three gifts is what our salvation in Christ uh, involves. And I, uh, uh, 
through only through divine intervention, um, I stumbled across uh, Pastor uh, Colin Smith in Chicago, which I've listened to on the radio many times, and hit a short, a very short explanation of our justification. Because what we got to look at is the three steps, those three gifts that we get. Okay, our justification, our sanctification, and our glorification. Now we got to get this. We, I, 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 if I don't get anything else across in this lesson, it's got to be that. And I'm going to do all three of them, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to dig heavily into them. But it's food for thought because as a Christian, as a Christian, you've got to get this. What what we've got here is those gifts, and it's like the gift of justification, as I just said. It's it's uh, it's being made right, but the gift of which our sins are forgiven. That's what. That's, that's what that gift is. Now, sanctification is the gift of which we grow in the likeness of Christ. We grow in the likeness of Christ. That's what we do through our life, is we grow as Christians. And then glorification, the third gift, is the gift of which we enter into the everlasting joy of heaven with God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. So a nugget for you from Pastor Colin that I, I just was blown away by. The other per, one of the, the person on the cross, the thief on the cross, that Christ gave him salvation when he asked for it on the cross. When he asked for the salvation, what did, uh, what did Jesus tell him? He said, today you shall be with me in paradise. So it was not too late for him. But what happened when he did that? The thief on the cross, as far as I know, is the only person that missed out on sanctification. He went right straight. <laughs> this is good. He went right straight from justification to glorification all in the same day. So, but what did he miss out on? Well, he missed out on the sanctification process. What we are living right now, all of us, if you're within the sound of my voice, you're living it or should be living it. You're having the hard times. You're having the rough times. Sometimes that commitment is a very difficult thing to do. But the, 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 that, that thief, he, he missed out on uh, being baptized, he missed out on being in church and uh, and uh, and hearing the preacher preach and 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 being with uh, other Christians and, and just uh, the the glorious path that we take when we're getting ourselves more like Christ during the sanctification process. So it, it's just a nugget, but it's just the the idea that you know that we are justified. We are justified by the death of Jesus. For if we were, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now see, we are reconciled because of his death, but when we look at when we were enemies, have you ever thought about that? People will read right by that. I hadn't looked at any other version to see what that version said. I've not done it, but um, it could say use another word, but I love that. It says enemies. Why, are we, why were we enemies? Before we were saved by the grace of Jesus, we were his enemy. You might not like the word, huh? But if you think about it, you're either for him or you're against him. Scripture clearly tells us that. So if you're against him, you're his enemy. And if you're his enemy, well, we shall be saved by whose life? Verse 10 says, his life. So we are reconciled by his death on the cross is what happened to us. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, the atonement or the reconciliation. We have been reconciled by his death. What that done is brought us together with him. And, and, and sal salvation Salvation is a, as we see, a step-by-step -step process, but it's got to begin with the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the blood he shed on the cross for us. 
Verse 12 picks right up on that, and it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Stop right there on that real quick. Therefore, as by one man sin, wow, who in the world was one man that sinned to, 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 to mess it up for everybody in the whole world? Adam, of course. So by Adam's sin entered into the world and death by sin. There would have been no death if, it had been, if, if they, he had not sinned and passed it on to every living person in the world. Passed it on to everyone, it says, and so death passed upon all men. And for all have sinned. We know that we have all sinned, and it's been passed on from the very first person. Verse 18 and 19 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, the one being Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men into just, justification of life. Get that right there. What was I just talking about? The three gifts, justification, sanctification, and glorification, right? Well, right here, Paul said, the righteousness, even by the righteousness, so by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift. It's not really a gift if it's not free, is it? Huh? You know, <laughs> uh, came upon all men unto justification of life. The free gift of eternal life is what we have received as Christians from Jesus' death on that cross. And his resurrection, of course. Can never talk about this without talking about the resurrection. What other faith? What other faith? What other belief has got a resurrected Christ that, we, that they believe in? Nobody. There's only one Jesus, and the only way to heaven is through him. And he tells you that. And I believe him, don't you? For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. <laughs> Everybody was made sinners. So by the obedience of one <laughs> shall many be made righteous. Now, the thing is, what we got to look at by that one now, the difference is in this verse, one man's disobedience made all sinners, okay, made all sinners. But the obedience of one, the obedience of Christ to the Father, shall many, many be made righteous. Not all, because all will not come to Christ. All will not come. We know that. And so by all not coming to Christ, what we've got to look at is what's going, what's going to happen in that also. Well, when we look at that, we will see that in verse 20, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Paul is bouncing back and forth in this, as you notice. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So, Got to be very careful, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Okay, so let's, let's just look at that and analyze that real closely right here. The law entered that the offense might abound. So what, what Paul is saying, and the offense would be sin. But what he is saying here, what the law did, so the law is not salvation by no means. But what the law did, the law made man's sin clearer by contrasting it with God's holy standards. There's what the law done. Before the law, in Moses' time, the law, uh, people were going and just going and going and going and really not knowing any better. And then as the, and as the law was presented to them, then they, they were faced with their disobedience and the understanding of what they were doing wrong. Did it stop them from doing wrong? No. But what it did, it, made, it exposed that, that, that sin to everyone. And the sins were many, and the law showed that the sins. But it's just, that's the law. But the sin, but where sin abounded, and let's, let's call it multiplied, if you will, okay? Moreover, the law entered that the offense might multiply, but where sin multiplied or abounded, grace. 
Grace did much more abound. Grace. See, we are all saved by grace. Undeserved grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. It's the greatest gift there is. But we can't earn it. Uh, people, there are those that think that works will get them to heaven. Well, it won't. But the way I look at works, and I think this is, well, I, I, this is what the scripture says. When we, when we look at grace and the free gift of grace versus works, if you are truly saved and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ like you should, then that grace abounds in you and works will become something that comes natural to you. You will want to do good things. Those good things are not going to send you to heaven. There's going to be a lot of good people in hell. Speaking of that, what we're doing, what Jesus has done by dying on the cross for us, he has diverted us from the wrath of the Father. Got to ask yourself a question. If you are not saved right now, you do not believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you draw your last breath, you're going to go to hell. There's, there's no gray area. There's two choices. You believe in Jesus or you suffer the wrath of God in hell. I'm not, I'm not going to go into the hell thing, but I firmly believe what the book of Revelation tells us as far as what hell is like. I don't want no part of it, I can tell you that. I still sin, I still come short, but I am forgiven, and that's what's important. As the sin have reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ has given us eternal life, and we will have eternal life. And we just, we have got to have that commitment out where it can be seen. We've got to see, people has to see, let others see Jesus in you. That's where the commitment comes from. Christ died for us. And the very least we could do for him is to follow through with the commitment that we have made to glorify him and to worship him and to love him. Father, we thank you. We thank you for everything that you do, everything that you have done, and everything that you will do. Father, we just love you. We thank you for the, the blessing of today. And Father, we just pray that you will continue to uh, guide us in the direction we need to go. This world is in a mess right this minute, and we know that. But you're in charge. It's your creation. You, you are the one that's in charge of everything. You give the devil as much rope as you want to give him, but he, he's on a leash, and it's your leash you're holding it. So, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for him going to that cross for us and dying for our sins. And it is through him I humbly offer you this prayer. Amen.